Hi, everyone. Um, great to be here for the uh, climate finance panel. And so glad to have um, a fantastic uh, uh, set of panelists here to talk about the uh, subjects that we'll be addressing this morning. So I'd like to just uh, introduce the panelists that we have uh, and just uh, identify uh, their title and, and where they are working. Um, so this is not in any particular order, uh, just going, going along uh, the list of uh, panelists here. So we have uh, Sarah Hughes, who is Head of Sustainability North America at Schroeder's. We have Lindsay Ross, Director of Global Client Services at 427. Uh, Michael Jacobs is joining us, Vice President in Institutional Sales at Goldman Sachs. Sky Dalmeda, who is Senior Vice President of Green Investor Coverage at Macquarie. And Dan Carey, who is Senior Vice President of Green Investment Group, also at Macquarie. So welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, my name is Tricia Bauman, and I am CEO and founder of a New York City consultancy offering strategic communications, leadership communications, and stakeholder development strategies uh, in environmental social governance uh, impact initiatives. And uh, really happy to be diving into the um, topics that we're gonna be looking at today. Um, just to share, just to launch, um, uh, I'd like to share a quote from UN Deputy Secretary General Amina Mohammed uh, that she shared uh, recently. Uh, it is estimated that climate action will yield economic gains of $26 trillion by 2030 compared with business as usual. And um, we see, of course, uh, interest as well as capital allocation increasingly moving into uh, what is called uh, climate finance, but also sustainable finance, as well as ESG, environmental, social, and governance finance. Um, so they're pretty much synonymous as terms. Um, and we see this increasing. We've seen a 42% increase of capital allocation between 2018 and 2020. And um, it's, it's an ever increasing uh, uh, proportion of, um, of uh, certainly um, asset management uh, that is domiciled in the United States, but also uh, overseas as well. And um, what I'd like to start is if each of you, each of the panelists could uh, just uh, introduce yourself and take a few minutes just talking about uh, your particular area of responsibilities in this ecosystem of um, climate finance, uh, ESG finance, and um, what are the functions or services of your particular office or division within the broader industry? just to situate the audience in terms of the industry and what is your particular area um, of focus uh, in your work. Um, so maybe, um, Sarah, would you like to start? Great, thank you. And um, great introduction, I love that quote. Um, I'm Sarah Bratton Hughes. I head up sustainability for Schroeder's in North America. Um, for those of you who are unfamiliar with who Schroeder's is, um, we are a $700 billion asset manager uh, headquartered out of the UK with offices globally. Uh, we've been committed to sustainable investing back since the uh, late 90s. So uh, before probably many of you uh, were, were born, uh, we have been committed to this as a firm. Um, we have 100% uh, ESG integration across all of our managed assets here at Schroeder's. Um, and from a product perspective, we can uh, offer anything from integrated to impact across both public as well as private markets. And I'm sure, I'm sure we'll get into solutions later. Our team is most well known for our uh, tools that we have developed uh, that have quantified some of these sustainability risks, both on the climate as well as the social side. Um, that gives us the ability to measure and, and manage over the long term. In terms of my role here in North America, I uh, lead our strategy, uh, product development, as well as integration with our investment teams uh, on the ground for sustainability. Great, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, Sky, would you like to follow? Sure, hi everyone. Sky Dalmeda from the Green Investment Group at Macquarie. 
So yes, Macquarie, just very, very quickly, we're a global diversified financial group. Uh, we've been around for 51 years, we're listed. We're the world's largest infrastructure investor, but we do a lot more than that. Um, I'm based in New York and um, my role is I sit within a, a dedicated group called the Green Investment Group, where uh, a group of over 450 people globally who exclusively focus on green asset creation. And what that means is we are creating physical assets. So building wind and solar farms, waste to energy, energy storage, um, electric mobility, uh, anything that really that you think of that, that is green and has a positive environmental impact and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and we're a bit unique in that we're actually investing Macquarie's balance sheet capital. So we're getting in really early, uh, you know, as early as concept stage, and we'll invest our own money in, in DevEx and construction equity. And then we'll often bring in a partner uh, to come to invest alongside us um, once the asset is sufficiently de-risked. Um, and those partners are often you know, institutional investors, pension funds, sovereign wealth funds, infrastructure funds. And um, so they'll either partner with us or they'll take 100% equity. They'll buy it off us once it's sort of construction ready or operational, and then they'll own the asset long term. So it's my job to, to find those investors and to really understand who's actively acquiring and managing green assets across the Americas. Great. Thanks so much, Sky. Um, so Lindsay, would you like to follow? Sure. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me here today. My name is Lindsay. I'm a director of global client services with 427. And so I work with our clients to help them understand their exposure to physical climate risks. So these are things like sea level rise and hurricanes and floods. And what we do is we translate climate models into actionable intelligence for our clients. So what does it mean to be exposed to hurricanes at a high level and what can they do to build resilience against those types of hazards? Our clients include some of the world's largest investors, asset managers, commercial banks, development finance institutions. We work with individual corporations as well and government agencies too. 427 was founded in 2012 following Hurricane Sandy when our CEO realized the impact of extreme weather on financial markets and the real economy as well. The financial system is obviously vulnerable to physical climate risks, which means all of us that participate in the real economy are vulnerable too. It's essential to build resilience and adapt to coming climate changes. And so that's what we hope that our data can bring to financial markets. So thanks for having me. Mm -hmm. Great. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Um, I just want to uh, check. It looks like uh, Michael Jacobs is not with us. Um, is that right? Um, Elliot, maybe if you could indicate um, in the chat. Perhaps. Is he here? Um, I don't see him, and I followed up with him. It's possible that he missed the, he mixed up the time. Um, but I think you guys can just go on and continue. It's it's awesome so far. Really, really loving the conversation so far. Okay. Okay. And I just also want to clarify that Dan Carey is not joining yes, us. Yes, I need to. Um, yeah, he, I'm standing in. Well, we were both going to be on the panel. You just have me. I'm sorry, but I hope I'm enough. <laughs> well, <laughs> not a problem. I just don't want to miss someone who's actually, you know, somewhere. Um, all right, great. So, Thank you so much for sharing, you know, where you all are within this um, industry, um, all the different component parts and um, drivers um, of intelligence and transaction. Um, I'd like to just take a start by taking a look at uh, a recent uh, study that came out of NYU's Stern Center for Sustainable Business, uh, which was um, somewhat of a landmark uh, project. Uh, one of the findings of many, um, including the obviously the um, business case for sustainability, which um, as well as the broader economic case for sustainability, which is now pretty much undisputed. Uh, wondering if you could talk about this finding that is one of uh, the key findings that they came across, which is that 
Sustainability initiatives at corporations appear to drive better financial performance due to what they refer to as mediating factors, such as improved risk management and more innovation. And so I'm wondering, um, obviously there's this aspect of, of risk, um, being able to assess risk and avoid the risk of climate impacts, but I'm wondering if you could talk about ways that perhaps you are seeing uh, that uh, opportunities are being identified for better returns due specifically to sustainable innovation and business strategy. So the upside uh, in addition to what could be referred to as the downside. And maybe Sky, do you wanna, do you wanna start with that? Oh, yes. I mean, from my perspective in the role that I serve in, um, and, and I guess in terms of how our business model works within the Green Investment Group, we won't develop an asset unless there's a long-term buyer. And so we need to know that there's going to be someone that once we put all our money in and all our time and effort to create these assets, that there's, you know, a buyer ready to, ready to buy it from us and hold it for the long term. And I think what we're seeing, you know, in the four years that I've been at Macquarie covering investors is an incredible growth in appetite from buyers for um, assets that meet their ESG requirements and, and in particular, you know, assets that are mitigating emissions and, and renewable energy in, in the US has been um, extremely popular. So there's, there's a huge amount of appetite from these end investors and, and that means that we're able to put more money to work, develop more assets um, because of this demand. So I'd say that, you know, our business is, is growing rapidly and that's, you know, in large part due to the sort of end investor appetite for ESG. Great, thank you. And um, Sarah, do you wanna maybe share your thoughts on that? Sure, I 100% I agree. I mean, first and foremost, we're, we're an asset manager. Our fiduciary duty is to maximize long-term risk-adjusted returns on behalf of our clients. And we see sustainability, and we've always seen sustainability back to the 90s as a key lever in order for us to do that. So I always say to everybody, we didn't start this and continue to invest throughout the years in our team um, because we thought it was going to be the topic du jour in 2021. Um, we've done this and always continue to do this in order to maximize those long-term risk-adjusted returns for our clients. Where I really think we are right now is really in this paradigm shift. And what, what drove returns for the last 30 years is not going to drive returns for the next 30 years. And the easiest way to sit back and look at that is just to look at our broadest base index here in the U.S., which is the S&P 500. If you look back in um, into 1975, which I know seems long ago to many people on this call, um, you would see that the amount of a company's balance sheet that was in tangibles versus intangibles. So that meant that 85% of a company's balance sheet was in tangibles. Those were tangible assets, plants, um, product, tangible assets, and 15% was an intangible. So that's in your people, that's in your IP, that's in your technology. What we saw today, the most recent study, 90% of a company's market value here in the S&P 500 is tied up um, in intangible assets. So you have to be thinking about these pre-financial risks when you're looking at an investment. And I use the term pre-financial very explicitly because some people refer to sustainability risks as non-financial. They're not non-financial, they're pre-financial. And what you can find is if you look at those same companies in the S&P 500, the majority of them and the top 100 in it have at least one sustainability risk in their 10K, most of them multiple. If it is material and enough for that company to file with the regulators, then it is a pre-financial risk going forward. And then if we just take a step back and Sky hit on a lot of these points is that we're continuing to see increasing consumer demand. So uh, we do a global investor survey every year, uh, most of the time, and those I love that this is a ladies panel. Uh, we can all tell you that we have spent the past few years uh, saying that investing sustainably does not have to cost you performance. What we saw happen in 2021 in our own 
uh, investor survey is that um, actually 55% of Americans were concerned if they weren't investing sustainably, that would cost them performance. Then you have the economics working. In order to get anything to work, the economics have to work. Um, and you, in most, if not all cases, you can see green power is more, and green energy sources are much more economically attractive than legacy fossil fuels. Well, the third leg is about to drop or is dropping as we can speak, and that's the policy, right? So we're now seeing uh, global policy. We've seen this pent up and build up over the last few, few years with the US maybe a step behind. Um, you're now seeing all of these globe, countries globally, although they're having their own disparate policy um, discussions, they're all favorable towards sustainable and green investing. So you're really seeing this third leg of the stool dropping right now that is um, continuing to and, and really transforming our, our economy. Thank you. Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, really thorough um, uh, analysis there. Um, I'm wondering, Lindsay, uh, so you, you know, at 427, you're looking at risk assessment. Uh, to what extent um, is there uh, an optic toward um, the upside of the um, sustainable business strategy in the research, the data, the analytics uh, that are underway or maybe coming ahead for what you're doing? Yeah, thanks for the question. So you're right, 427 is very squarely focused on physical climate risk. And unfortunately, there's not much upside there. We know that almost everybody on the globe is going to be affected in some way or other by our continued emissions. So, and, and the subsequent warming and impacts in the atmosphere. But Moody's, our parent company, 427 got a majority share investment from Moody's in 2019. And so over the past couple of years, they've really been making investments of both time and money into other ESG environmental, social and governance data providers, in addition to 427, which focuses on physical climate risk. So at that time, another company which they invested in called Vigio Iris or VE, they provide ESG assessments. Uh, so of companies and other types of issuers, sovereign issuers as well. And so they provide a view into market opportunities as well. So opportunities in the energy transition as we move away from a carbon-based economy towards a low carbon economy, what are some good companies to invest in? Who are the ones that have sustainability uh, as a forefront strategy or have green products uh, as part of their turnover? And then there's another group within VE as well that provides views on green bonds. So green bonds are moving in the direction of sustainability linked loans. So those specific use of proceeds for green projects, green infrastructure maybe. And so now they're being even tied to metrics for that. So what is the performance of the green bond in terms of its goals of promoting green investment? So Moody's, our parent company has been doing a lot in this space, more than just the physical climate aspect that 427 focuses on, which is obviously very risk focused but on the energy transition side as well, where there's plenty of opportunities as well. That's interesting. Thanks, uh, Lindsay. I'm wondering if we could, I just want to follow, follow up with the next question. Maybe I'll start with you um, in view of what you've just shared. Uh, to what extent, um, if at all, is the S and ESG a part of 427? And um, and even, you know, just in terms of your own uh vantage point, you know, uh, steeped uh, in this industry um, from the analytics standpoint, um, how are you seeing the S, the social, uh, you know, played out or will be played out, um, given that it's been a little bit more challenging to actually arrive at um, uh, reliable uh, standards of data for that for S? Right. Over the years that I've been working in the ESG space, this has always been one that investors have had a really hard time measuring, like you say. The advantage of um, VE, actually, their position in the market is that they've always been very focused on the S component of ESG, so the social elements. They're based in Europe, based in Paris, uh, so very focused on you know, human rights, human resources types of issues, gender on boards, these sorts of issues that are known to have a high impact when it comes to ESG performance of companies, for instance. 
Um, so it is something that VE, I think, has an advantage compared to other ESG sort of data providers in the market, actually. It's been their, their area of focus. It is admittedly one of the, the harder things to measure still. Thank you, thank you. Um, so I'm also wondering, maybe um, I'd love to hear from Sarah and also from um, Sky on that point. Um, maybe Sarah, if you could launch. Um, I'm curious, um, in what ways uh, are you working with the S? And um, you know, there are hundreds of frameworks uh, in the market right now. So um, what are some ways that you're actually being able to get some traction to be able to compare apples with apples um, on this aspect of S? So. I am the sole American on our 23 person dedicated sustainability team. Um, so I am always ha so happy when somebody asks about the S because that is um, something that I'm hyper, hyper focused on. And actually I think um, from an institutional investor perspective is something that even before we saw the you know, 2020 here in the US, institutional investors were, were focused on it. So we had, you know, 2019, the year of Greta, 2020, the year of COVID and social injustices. But I think we should all acknowledge that these issues are interlinked. Um, and somebody said this, I wish it was my own quote, but that like G is in the ESG, G governance is the mother of ENS. And I really do think that that um, is true, but it should be like this you know, interlinking triangle uh, circles uh, rather than this broken up the E, S, and G. So we look at actually everything from the stakeholder lens. But um, yeah, standardization is a massive problem when it comes to much of the S data. And it's a massive problem actually also from a legal perspective because what it is legal for big global firms. So what it is legal to disclose here in the US, you actually can't ask certain people in Europe first. And then you, you wanna talk about diversity. Well, what's diversity in the US for diversity in Asia. So it is really hard from a standardization perspective um, to do something. But uh, diversity as well as the concept of quality jobs is something that I'm hyper focused on. Um, and I look at diversity from a, from a uh, sort of dimensions of diversity perspective. Um, I think we've come a very long way on the E with the reality of carbon pricing becoming more and more likely. People understand how it can impact a company's business model and people acknowledge that scope one, two, and three carbon are, um, are material, potentially material to a company's business model. But I think about it in terms of sort of scope one, two, and three diversity. And first diversity is what are you doing as the firm? What is Shorter's doing at the PLC level? What are we doing uh, for our employees to ensure that we have um, diversity and diversity of thought, both representation and cognitive diversity um, throughout our firm? Then there's two, who's running your money, right? It has been shown that more diverse investment teams have um, a lower risk adjust, uh, have a lower risk and many oftentimes outperform uh, their peers. Um, and then three, much like scope three carbon within your supply chain, within the investments we are putting to work, um, how are the investments that we're investing in? How are they thinking about diversity? How are they thinking about supply chain? How are they thinking about health and safety? Um, so it is a harder issue to quantify. Uh, but what we can tell you is, especially if you look, and I'm going to totally leave infrastructure to Sky because she can talk me under the table on that and focus on sort of corporates. And um, if you look at it, what you can see, and, and the numbers don't lie, is that corporate culture drives return. Um, and it's often a larger driver when you're looking at companies than anything that companies are doing, well, dependent on industry, but if you're looking at some industries that are services-based, it's a larger driver than return to, than how they're handling the climate issue. So um, we are we are continuously working that, enhancing that, enhancing different ways to potentially quantify that risk. Because in order to get investors to pay attention to things, you have to translate these issues. And I think Lindsay mentioned this earlier, you have to translate it into the language that investors speak, which is data and dollars. They don't speak in carbon footprint. They don't speak in physical risk. It's that translation piece. But Sky, I'll throw it over to you because I don't wanna go near how you think about this from an infrastructure perspective. Thanks, Sarah, and uh, I'm, I'm glad you handled all the corporate stuff because you, you definitely taught me under the table there. But I think in, in terms of, um, I mean, just quickly to touch on the corporate side, you know, we, Macquarie, look, we have an ESG framework and there's sort of eight different ways we think about ESG. Um, and the S is really comes up in, in most of those eight ways. But, you know, one is, you know, managing 
um, ENS risk. So that's in how we think about our investment decisions and making sure that you know we're really factoring in social risks before we make any investment decision. And then once we own the assets, making sure that we're responsible owners of those assets. And so you know, touching on a lot of the things that Lindsay said. Um, we also have uh, a second one of the eight is um, ENS financing. So that's more about really focusing on actively pursuing opportunities that you know have demonstrable uh, ENS positive benefits. So um, that's that's you know I guess clean tech, social infrastructure um, are often things that come up there. And, and I'll come to the infrastructure point that, that Sarah um, made in a moment. Then there's um, the third, fourth and fifth uh, your business conduct and ethics, um, our people and workplace, our, how we treat our clients. Um, and the sixth is our community. And, and actually, sorry, before I move on to the community, I think our people and our workplace, you know, diversity and inclusion is obviously a pretty big focus. The, the finance industry in general, has not done very well on this across the board. Um, you know, there's, I think we've made a lot of progress. We've got a pretty incredible female CEO. We've got a lot of females in senior positions and there's a lot of initiatives to um, improve there, but there's obviously more than just gender diversity and, and there's more that we need to do. And I think Macquarie is very focused on that. I will say that we won um, best place to work for LGBTQ uh, equality by the human rights campaign last year. And I think we also won it the year before that. Um, but yes, certainly there's always room for improvement. And I think we're pretty focused on that. The final piece around community um, you can think of it in two ways. One is, is all the work that our foundation does. So we have a, a foundation that um, donate, we've donated over 300 million so far um, to communities. And, and there's really active encouragement of, of pro bono advisory, um, nonprofit board placements, uh, and then also sort of active volunteering. So the, the foundation does a lot of work there, but I think um, the piece that Sarah was, was alluding to is really how we think about the impact of our business activities. And given we are the world's largest infrastructure investor, um, this is pretty important. And I think a lot of the infrastructure we build is, is being used by people every day and has a direct impact on the, on the communities and, and a lot of sort of hopefully positive social outcomes if we do it right. And our CEO is actually very, very focused on this point and, and recently sort of uh, directed us to really focus in on what do we think are the unmet community needs? Um, how can we have a positive social impact through our expertise and our investment activities and has really empowered us to go out and pursue those activities. So um, I think that that's something that's, you know, not necessarily a cultural shift, it's probably, uh, an evolution over time, but it's it's really at the forefront of everything that we're doing and thinking about. Great, thanks so much, Sky. Um, so I'd like to follow up with a next question, sort of uh, jumping on what Sky is sharing around infrastructure, um, and uh, take a look at um, this, um, you know, multi-sector dynamics that are driving this aspect of sustainable finance, and um, particularly with this new administration and the U.S. is now. Um, what I would say very happily back into the Paris Agreement. Um, and we have um, obviously um, policy unrolling. Uh, it was just announced recently that uh, uh, Biden is uh, funneling billions into clean tech uh, um, and uh, infrastructure, uh, many of which, which are targeting, uh, you know, what is referred to as green jobs and obviously building up uh, uh, infrastructure resources uh, to be more resilient um, and to uh, also uh, reduce, obviously, uh, emissions impact. So wondering, maybe, Sarah, if you could launch with this, um, how are you seeing uh, these policies uh, impact the work that you're doing and the broader industry? And also, um, to what extent do you see uh, planning and and strategy development around what is pretty much considered an imminent uh, carbon uh, price. Yeah, so from a policy perspective, and somebody put it in the Q&A, um, I think being a European-based manager, we are um, 
a, a formerly European based manager, I should say that we're out of the UK now with Brexit, uh, but we do sell a lot of business uh, into Europe. We have offices all over Europe. Um, somebody had mentioned the EU Green New Deal, as well as the EU Sustainable Finance Package. Um, there is significant policy going on within the EU to cut down on what is considered greenwashing. So to ensure that investment dollars are actually going into green and social uh, solutions. But it's not just that. The EU has put the flag in the ground that not only are they going to be the leader in fund disclosures, but also uh, the next phase of their taxonomy is focused on driving capital away from legacy, uh, quote unquote, dirty or brown industry and into green uh, finance. So what you're seeing is a lot of that um, driving, continuing to drive consumer demand. And Trisha, you had talked about it early on, the increase in flows that we're seeing into sustainable solutions. And I think that um, that is evolving as well. So historically, it used to be focused on broad based or you could, you can think of sustainable investing like the ABC. So, and this is a framework done by the impact management project. Um, so a stands for acting to avoid harm. So that's focused on sustainability, uh, managing sustainability risks, as well as potentially uh, screening out industries that um, are negative to environment and social. Uh, B is focused on benefiting the stakeholders so that you're systematically incorporating sustainability into your investment process to lead to a, a better risk adjusted returns, but still much more focused on that risk side of it. And it's a very inclusionary approach to sustainability, not an exclusionary approach. And then C, contributing to solutions. So that's when you're trying to direct your investment dollars into funds that are contributing to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. What we've seen from a policy perspective, um, A is there's still a group of, of investors that are focused on what I would call SRI, so socially responsible investing. Um, from an from an investor landscape, B, which is sort of benefiting from incorporating sustainability into your investment process, so you're expecting better financial returns. Um, I think with the reality of carbon pricing coming, uh, you're, we're continuing to get um, both carbon pricing as well as net zero commitments. I don't know how many of you guys are watching the NCAA basketball tournament, both on the men's and women's side. Every single commercial is about a company that has come out and made a net zero commitment. Maybe not every single one, but every other one. Um, so you're continuing to see people um, continue to move on the climate side. Um, in lockstep with what some of the policy that you're seeing on a global perspective, because these are all big global firms. But where you're seeing the investment dollars really start going is the C bucket, where people are saying, actually, I wanna actively contribute to these solutions, as well as you're having this groundswell of policy uh, pushing it that way. Um, so what you're seeing right now, and we I touched on this early, is really this paradigm shift. And there's a lot of money in motion um, and moving out of different industries. So if management teams, if investors aren't acknowledging this, uh, Warren Buffett says it the best, when the tide goes out, you're gonna see who's caught swimming naked. Thanks, thanks so much, Sarah. Yeah, that's a great quote. It's been, um, I hear it being referred to increasingly these days and I, for the reasons that we're all talking about. Um, so Lindsay, I was wondering, could you talk about um, this, uh, aspect of a uh, price on carbon and the work that you're doing um, at 427. And there, a question came in from uh, one of the attendees around um, what's the risk that companies will attempt to look better on paper while nothing actually changes in the world? So I, maybe if you could speak to that, Lindsay. Of course, yeah. The greenwashing question is super important to understand. There's plenty of claims that companies can make because there's so much demand to act well in terms of climate um, and to try to grab that market share. So uh, the investors that we work with, I'll address that first, they really want to understand the impacts of any impending policy changes like a carbon tax or other regulations changing in the EU as well around disclosure, financial uh, sustainability issues. So things like the network for greening, the financial system, this is a group that we're working with as well. They are working on 
potentially handing down stress tests uh, of financial portfolios. So how do physical climate risks impact portfolios, but as well, how do transition risks potentially impact portfolios? So again, changing to a low carbon economy. And the physical impacts, while they're occurring today, we know they're expected to get worse further into the future, the more that we continue to emit. But the transition impacts can happen tomorrow. If there's a carbon tax implemented tomorrow, everyone's portfolios would be affected immediately. So just to say that Moody's Investor Service, Moody's Analytics, and us at Moody's ESG are all working in conjunction together on these sorts of issues to help meet that need to help investors understand what are the implications of those policies going to be. And it depends on the type of investor that we're working with and the amount of impact that it's going to have. So I work primarily with investors in the real estate space in, in North America. And so for them, it's things like green building standards. You know, in New York has uh, very high green building standards. They need to move to LEED certification and those sorts of things in the built environment. And so they want to understand how will their operations cost change over time with a carbon tax. Um, and then uh, where it comes to physical climate, of course, that's where I'm more squarely focused on than the carbon transition issue. So real estate investors in that space want to understand what's the impact of sea level rise going to be in conjunction with these sorts of transition issues. So they want to understand the big picture and, and all at once because it's a, a very complex topic. Yeah, thank you, Lindsay. Um, and I, um, Sky, I'd like to um, direct a, a new question to you, and maybe if the other panelists could also speak to it. And that is this aspect of uh, standards. And, um, you know, I mentioned before, I think, you know, there's like maybe six or 700 <laughs> frameworks uh, in um, that are being used currently. Some of them are proprietary, uh, some of them are not. And, uh, you know, how, how do we ensure that apples are compared with apples uh, in this uh, situation of so many different ways to uh, assess? So, um, and also just want to say if maybe you could talk about what you see down the road and maybe a time frame, uh, if you're able to speak to that around um, truly, you know, what is being referred to as this, um, you know, International Sustainability Standards Board, so that there's truly an integrated uh, standard uh, for being able to address, assess, measure these issues. Yeah, sure. And and I can also just briefly touch. I probably have a better answer to the last question, but let me let me try to tackle this one. Um, and it also actually this question touches on one of the questions in Q and A about like, do we have climate scientists on? on our team, et cetera. So, um, and the reason my answer is not gonna be great for this one is this, we have a separate team that really works. We, there, some of them in Edinburgh, some are in London, um, who work actively with a number, they're working with the UN, they're working with um, actively contributing to the task force uh, for climate related disclosures um, and but I must confess that I, I don't know a ton about where all of that work is up to. Um, so, but we do, we did recently actually um, have David Viner join Macquarie. So he um, is an IPCC lead author and he um, heads the team that's that's managing all that work. And, you know, his, his background, um, you know, he's a climate scientist. He's been in this space for a very long time. If you Google him, you can um, see his credentials. So he's leading a team that's that's really focusing on standardisation because it's, it's very important to avoid this greenwashing issue. And I think there's a lot of bespoke methodologies being used right now and it's really hard for an apples to apples comparison. Um, just quickly on the carbon price question, which I, I think is an interesting one, and I just wanted to offer, you can probably tell from my accent, I'm Australian. Um, I wanted, I don't want to be jaded. I'm offering this because I hope that you can learn from our mistakes. Um, but we were kind of in a similar position back in, I used to work for the Australian government. I helped, um, there were, you know, we had thousands of people working on it. I wasn't the only person doing this, but I helped develop an emissions trading scheme in Australia back, um, this is back in 2009, where you know, it all looked really promising. We actually 
got the the emissions training scheme implemented in Australia. We did, you know, there was over a decade's worth of work that went into it, working really closely with industry um, to get, to make sure that we were comfortable that it wasn't going to, you know, uh, really damage our particular emissions intensive trade exposed industries, but also, you know, really affect the cost of living for vulnerable communities. Anyway, it was in place. Then we had a change of government and the next government pulled it out. And actually in 2009, that was also the time that you in the US had the Waxman-Markey bill. I think that that had, that went to, if I recall, was it passed in Congress? Was that right? But not the Senate. You all can probably pass by the House, but not the Senate. I don't think it actually, it was ever even brought to the Senate floor. But we were so encouraged by that bill and we thought great things were going to happen in the US. Um, we, you know, largely we were following it very closely and trying to model our scheme as well on some of the provisions and, and obviously it didn't happen. So I really hope that um, what gets passed, if anything gets passed, can be enduring, um, regardless of whether there's a change of administration or not, because investors it's really, really hard to invest in, in long-term sort of infrastructure assets that have 30 to 40 year lives um, and underwrite the, those based on a carbon price that may or may not be there in 30 to 40 years time. And so at the moment, all of the investments we make, we have to assume there's no carbon price and they have to be financially viable on their own. Um, and what that means is there's, you know, we're investing in large scale, you know, utility scale solar and wind and um, starting to invest in larger scale battery installations too. But there's other technologies out there that we could be investing in, but they're just not economically viable without some form of incentive or support. You know, I'm thinking about things like green hydrogen, where the cost differential between grey hydrogen and green hydrogen is so huge at the moment that, um, you could really benefit from a carbon price. So on a personal level, um, I really hope that something happens in the US that is enduring and that we can start investing in, in these sort of newer technologies that need that support. That's great. Thanks so much, Sky. Um, I'd like to, um, uh, we have to finish up unfortunately very soon, um, but uh, Sarah, I'm wondering if maybe you could speak to this question and this ties into a question that came from uh, a participant in the audience. Uh, this aspect of um, arriving at an international standard, um, and I've heard it uh, compared to, uh, for example, the International Accounting Standards Board. And I'm wondering, you know, if there is an international standards board for sustainability, um, is that maybe a way to avoid what one attendee here describes as the uh, left pocket and the right pocket doing different things where you're lobbying for one set of policy that can obviously change right with an administration like we've seen, um, rather than something that's enduring in terms of truly industry standards. Yes, so I wish I was more optimistic on the standards question. Um, I think I always compare it to when I clean my closet, it gets worse before it gets better. Um, and I think that might be what's happening. But what we're seeing to sort of end on a positive note, I do think there are standards out there that are globally starting to take foot, whether it's the SASB standard, uh, which is the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, full disclosure, we're on their investor advisory group. Uh, but I do think from a global perspective, you're starting to see some of these standards take place. Um, and then just optimistically, here in the US, you have the SEC has come out and announced their task force. Um, and I believe they're going to be looking at potentially standardizing both corporate disclosure, as well as fund disclosure to cut off on greenwashing in both corporate as well as um, asset management industry. So I'm optimistic from a regulatory perspective and all indications are um, that that is going to uh, potentially move forward. Great. Thanks so much, Sarah. So I, I, we're going to have to bring this to a, a close. Um, a question came in or, or an observation really around um, the gender on the panel. And um, we know uh, the data, which is that um, women are uh, more represented proportionally in ESG finance than in the um, financial industry uh, at, you know, full uh, spectrum. 
uh, mainstream. And uh, just wondering if you could share, since this is primarily a student audience or uh, emerging professionals, if you could talk a bit about how you got involved in what you did and anything you would offer to someone who's seeking to move into uh, the kind of work that you're doing. And maybe Lindsay, if you want to, if you want to launch with that. Yeah, thanks. I love this question because it's super personal to me. I spent a while after undergrad working for the federal government and working in various institutions in Washington, D.C., um, and decided I really needed to go back and get some more technical skills. So I have now a background in economics and finance explicitly, whereas before I had a more policy background. And so that really helped get me to where I am today. And when I came out of grad, my graduate school program, I was faced with the choice of working for a big consultancy firm or 427, which was a startup of 15 people at the time that, uh, that I joined it uh, three and a half years ago. And what was a huge driving factor for me in that, in that decision was that our CEO is a woman, she's fairly young, she's super energetic, she's a leader in this field. And that really inspired me to go with the somewhat more risky option of joining a startup over a very well-established consulting firm. So I love this question. I think it's great. I'd say focus on STEM, you know, focus on being loud, being, having a voice, you know, saying what you want to say, because it's time for everyone to start listening. And that's all I have to say. Thanks. Thanks so much, Lindsay. Sky, could you respond and share your um, perspective on that? Sure, yes. So I started about 13 year years ago in climate, in sustainability. Like I said, I was working for the Australian government. But I've subsequently, um, and back then, I so I studied a Bachelor of Business and a Bachelor of Science. Um, in Australia, you can do two degrees at once. Um, but had no idea what I wanted to do. I actually started working for a a television station in publicity and started, you know, climate quickly got on my radar and I started actively looking for roles in climate. Um, and I was looking at everything across corporate, across government, whatever there was. And it took a lot of attention, you know, I had to apply to a few different things. I had an environment, I did a couple of environmental science subjects and I really played those up. Um, and I also then eventually got an interview with the government, but I studied for that job interview like it was, you know, my master's thesis and you know, really put so much work in to make sure that I could convince them that I'd be valuable if they just hired me. Um, so that was my foot in the door. And I've subsequently worked in for nonprofit um c40 cities it's i still like the people there are like family to me and it was a very hard decision to leave there um and then you know now i've worked private sector i'm at macquarie and similar to Lindsay, it's i i had really just a, a public policy background and so i realized that i needed some more technical skills as well and i started studying my master of finance while i was working full-time um, and I don't think I would have got interviewed at Macquarie if I didn't have that Master of Finance. I was still a bit of an unusual hire for them, and it, it took some convincing again for them to hire me. Again, I, I made sure I was very prepared for those interviews. I think I had 11 interviews in total. Um, but I guess my advice is just even if you don't find the perfect first job in this space, you know, I think I've learned something new from every single one and just getting in the door and having some sort of climate experience is, is better than just trying to find your absolutely perfect job from the beginning. And you'll, you'll learn something from the people that you work with and the place you work in. And then hopefully that'll lead to the next thing. And the last thing, and then I'll shut up because I know we're over time um, is just put it out there to people that you're interested and you're looking because it's it's incredible how much people are willing to help you if you know they think you're a, someone they want to help but if people don't know you're interested in this then it makes it a lot harder for them to help you thanks so much fantastic advice sarah if you could share um, your perspective on that so I would say I arrived where I am by accident, but also by always saying yes. Um, so I did not go to a traditional finance target college at all um, and for our industry. And I um, 
I was able to get really connected with our alumni office actually um, and ended up getting a job at JP Morgan. Both of my parents were a non-for-profit and an insurance agent. So I had no idea about all the different aspects of finance. I thought it was this very niche thing, but it's actually huge. Um, asset management on itself is huge. Um, and I left JP Morgan to come to Schroeder's and my parents were like, what are you doing? Who is Schroeder's? Schroeder's is actually the fifth largest asset manager in the world. Uh, well, or in terms of brand, um, but we're not a household name here in the US. So um, I came, I ended up, you know, timing, luck, fate under a great portfolio manager, also a woman, Jenny Jones. Uh, she was a glass ceiling breaking investor. She's since retired, but oh, just a wonderful person. But Jenny didn't care about where you grew up or what school you went to. Um, and to me, it was about finding that team with that culture. She just cared about the results that you delivered. Um, so hard work, but uh, Jenny was also not a big inv believer in sustainable investing. Um, and we had a large book for the Nordics. So I've been a trader for 10 years. So, you know, even 10 years ago, asset owners in the Nordics were asking these questions and I was the millennial on the team. So they just sort of threw them my, uh, my way. Um, and that's like, just like Sky, a lot of studying, a lot of learning, a lot of coming up the, the field because I had come from a traditional finance background. And all of a sudden I was like, what's scope one, two, and three carbon? Like I had to learn all of these uh, issues. Um, and now I've continually challenged myself. And I think uh, being a panel of women is great. Um, and I know, you know, all of us at some point in time, whether it doesn't matter your gender, it doesn't matter your ethnicity, I think we all suffer from a little imposter syndrome. But it's all about digging down and, and believing in yourself and just say yes, figure it out later, um, and make the most of your opportunities. Thanks so much, Sarah. Great advice. So we have to bring this to a close. Um, thank you so much um, to uh, wonderful panelists, wonderful discussion here. So Sarah Hughes, Sky Dalmeda, and Lindsay Ross um, really value uh, your point of view and your uh, insights into these issues. And um, uh, so glad that we could bring this uh, to this audience. Uh, Elliot, uh, thank you very much and uh, wishing everyone a fantastic day. Thanks so much, Trisha. Thanks everyone. Thanks,